introduce to the public an idea of what would eventually become the proposed equal rights. Thanks, Sarah. Can we push the volume up, please? As old as the country itself, and the premise hasn't changed much since the first Alice Paul first wrote, "Equality of up. rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex." Gradually, instead of a little tiny cluster, we now have 10 million women backing this particular measure before Congress. It took 50 years for Congress, mostly made up of male lawmakers, to take action, passing the amendment in extraordinarily bipartisan fashion. But it faltered in the states. The ERA ran out of steam and hit a wall. I mean, yes, now, but it's a room there's that was new energy months. to try one more time to get it ratified. There is no deadline on equality. It's clear that the need for the ERA is just as fiercely urgent today as it was a century ago. We know that the three states have made the most recent difference. Thanks, Eric. We could probably go a little bit louder in the room. Illinois ratifying the ERA just a year later. And two years after that, Virginia became the 38th state pushing the, pushing the ERA past the threshold. It is possible to create gender equality in this country. And a final recognition that. Thanks, folks. That's a good level. Are equal. You said you cannot put a time limit on women's equality. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States Sorry, folks. If or we by go down a little state bit. on account of sex.
<laughs> this meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. This meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Well, it was a long time ago, many years. I was a young lawyer on my first assignment. New graduate of Georgetown Law School, I returned home to my home state of Illinois, where I was working in the Illinois State Senate for the Lieutenant Governor, Paul Simon. At the time, the lawmakers in my state were considering the ratification of a constitutional amendment that was first introduced many years before in 1923. It was called the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, here we are, a century after its first introduction, 2023, and here I am nearly 50 years after I started that first assignment. It's time to get the job done. In fact, it's long overdue. Today, this committee is holding a hearing on finally finally enshrining the Equal Rights Amendment into the Constitution. I want to start with a video. Thank you. I want to start with a video which gives us a little insight into the history of this issue. It was almost a hundred years ago in 1923 that Alice Paul, a leader of the women's suffrage movement, first introduced to the public an idea of what would eventually become the proposed Equal Rights Amendment. The debate is as old as the country itself, and the premise hasn't changed much since suffragette Alice Paul first wrote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And gradually, instead of a little tiny cluster, we now have 10 million women backing this particular measure before Congress. It took 50 years for Congress, mostly made up of male lawmakers, to take action, passing the amendment in extraordinarily bipartisan fashion. But it faltered in the states. The ERA ran out of steam and hit a wall. Now, there's new energy to try one more time to get it ratified. There is no deadline on equality. It's clear that the need for the ERA is just as fiercely urgent today as it was a century ago. We know that the three states that made the most recent difference were Nevada, 19, pardon me, 2017, Illinois, ratifying the ERA just a year later, and two years after that, Virginia became the 38th state, pushing the, pushing the ERA past the threshold. It is possible to create gender equality in this country. And a final recognition that women and men are equal. You said you cannot put a time limit on women's equality. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. I apologize for the audio. We'll try to make that a little better last time, but we didn't want anyone to miss any words. The principle of equal justice under the law is fundamental to who we are as a nation. But unless that principle is protected in our Constitution, it is nothing more than words. For a hundred years, Americans have been fighting to enshrine equality in our Constitution with the Equal Rights Amendment. One hundred years. In the half century since Congress approved the ERA, 38 states have ratified it. That's the exact number of states needed to certify the ERA as the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. 
So why the holdup? When Congress first approved the ERA in 1972, it imposed an arbitrary time limit on the ratification process. But that was more than 50 years ago. In the decades since, as I mentioned, the amendment has crossed the 38th state fresh threshold, with Virginia becoming the most recent state to approve it in 2020. Think of it this way. If not for Congress standing in the way, the ERA would already be on the books. So it's time to clear the path for equality. The joint resolution we're considering today will repeal that arbitrary deadline in the preamble of this resolution once and for all. There is no room for uncertainty when it comes to protecting equal rights under the law. Sadly, that lesson was driven home last year by the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade and for the first time in history to take away a constitutional right from every woman in America. For years, we've heard well-known arguments against the ERA. I remember the single-sex bathroom argument of many years ago. Some have argued that it's not necessary. Others have argued it's dangerous. Others have claimed that the ERA and the 14th Amendment are redundant. The reality is that the Supreme Court, which at the time was made up entirely of male justices, established a lower level of scrutiny for sex discrimination claims under the 14th Amendment. The ERA would finally change this. When we have a conservative supermajority on the Supreme Court who believe the meaning of the 14th Amendment was set in stone when it was ratified in 1868, the ERA is far from redundant. When a sitting judge, justice on the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, argues that the court should reconsider constitutional protections for family planning and birth control, protections the court recognized under the 14th Amendment nearly 60 years ago, the ERA is far from redundant, far from unnecessary. So now the question for members of this committee is straightforward. What kind of America do we want to leave our daughters and granddaughters? A country in which their fundamental rights are safe and secure, or one in which the Constitution continues to fail to recognize fundamental equality on the basis of sex? As a father and a grandfather, I think the answer is obvious. Let's live up to the promise of equal justice under the law. Join us in supporting this resolution to revoke the deadline on the ERA's ratification. There is no time limit on equality. With that, I'll turn to the ranking member, Lindsey Graham, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, this is a hearing that has a political agenda, which is okay. We're a political body. I have absolutely no problem talking about political things. Everybody's entitled to their causes. Everybody in America can, can push as hard as they like, but you got to look at the facts. So in 1972, the Congress, as you said, Mr. Chairman, by two thirds vote, put in motion the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment as drafted in 72 uh, for a seven year period. <clears throat> Apparently during that time period, they fell three votes short of 38. And this is what Justice Ginsburg said. The ERA fell three uh, states short of ratification hope somebody someday it will be put back in the political hopper starting over again collecting the necessary number of states to ratify it so that's what she said now <clears throat> there was an extension by majority of vote from 79 to 82 which you referred to to give three more years to try to make up the shortfall <clears throat> that didn't happen but what did happen five states who had previously ratified the amendment rescinded it. Kentucky, Idaho, Nebraska, Tennessee, and South Dakota. So from the time period in question, the support for the amendment went backwards. And this resolution before us is pretty simple. It says there will be no time limit to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, but it also acknowledges that the Equal Rights Amendment is part of our Constitution. Well, that's what disturbs me the most because it never received 38 uh, states during the time period in question. And Dillon versus Gloss, the Supreme Court concluded that Congress 
has the power to set time limits on when an amendment must be ratified. So it's gone to the Supreme Court. You lost there. It never got 38 votes uh, before 1982. There's been an effort to 1982 to add to the vote total. You didn't mention it. Five states rescinded. So it's never gotten 38 votes if you count rescinding by five states. And I think it would be pretty obvious why five states rescinded when you look at the potential effect of this amendment. So we will have this debate, and I think we're going to have a vote on the floor. I think Senator Schumer promised a closer vote. I think it will fall well short of the 60 votes necessary, and I'll be glad to talk about the reasons why. But um, thank you for the hearing. Thank you, Senator Graham. Today we welcome three members of Congress to testify before the Committee on the Equal Rights Amendment. Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland, Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, and Senator Hyde Smith of Mississippi. Senators Cardin and Murkowski have co-led the bipartisan joint resolution to affirm ratification of the ERA by removing the arbitrary deadline in its preamble. Senator Cardin, could you please proceed with your statement? Well, first, thank you, Chairman Durbin, and I also want to thank Ranking Member Graham for the courtesy of being able to testify on this bill, and thank you for holding this hearing. I do want to acknowledge the extraordinary leadership of Senator Murkowski on this issue, maintaining the bipartisan support for the Equal Rights Amendment, from which we saw from its inception. This is not about any one issue, but it's about putting in our Constitution a lens of equality in judging the actions of our st states and laws uh, of our country. Senate Joint Resolution 4 simply states, and, and you put this in the video, but I want to repeat it because it's pretty straightforward. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Quite frankly, most Americans already believe this is in our Constitution. But Congress needs to complete the job and remove any ambiguity. 38 states have ratified the amendment. That's the prerequisite number, three quarters of the states of our nation. Article 5 of the Constitution puts no time limits on the amount of time necessary for ratification. And I would point out that the 27th Amendment of our Constitution was part of the original Bill of Rights proposed in 1791 and ultimately ratified in 1992, over 200 years later, dealing with the congressional pay issue. Congress established a time limit for ratification. We're unclear of the effect on that. Congress has the authority to remove that time limit. Senate Joint Resolution 4 does exactly that. The prerequisite, the president for Congress to declare that a requisite number of states have ratified a constitutional amendment as the House and Senate did this in 1992 by the resolution affirming the validity of the 27th Amendment. So this is not the first time we see in a, in a resolution the acknowledgement that the prerequisite number of states have ratified the constitutional amendment. And as you point out, there should be no time limit on equality. It is needed to advance equality in the fields of workforce and pay, sexual harassment, and violence protection for the LGBTQ plus community, and so many other areas where this particular provision would provide a strict inter, uh, standard for the courts to apply in regards to laws and governmental policies. The Equal Rights Amendment is all about equality, the most fundamental of American values. A hundred years ago, we, women received the right to vote. And it's been a hundred year struggle to put the Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution. America strengthens in its values. Mr. Chairman, I would point out that 85% of the countries in the world have some form of an Equal Rights Amendment in their Constitution. And most of our states have some provision against discrimination based upon sex. The U.S. is the only industrial democracy that does not have a protection in their Constitution against discrimination based upon sex. The ERA is important for us to pass in regards to our own protections, but also for, for America's leadership on our basic values. We got to take care of our work at home first. So on behalf of my wife, on behalf of my two uh, granddaughters and my daughter and all Americans, let us do what's right to put equality in our Constitution to take a major step forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Senator Cardin. Senator Hyde-Smith. Good morning, Chairman Dor Durbin and Ranking Member Graham and colleagues. I sure appreciate this opportunity very, very much. And I'm honored to be here this morning to discuss the Equal Rights Amendment, the unconstitutional and deeply misguided effort to resurrect a proposed constitutional amendment that expired over 40 years ago. The Equal Rights Amendment proposes to add very vague language to the U.S. Constitution to ensure equality between the sexes. However, the ERA won't do that. In fact, it would do the exact opposite and instead harm the very woman it intends to protect. Since 1972, the year that the Equal Rights Amendment was sent to the states for potential ratification, women's rights have advanced by leaps and bounds. Good things came out of this. Today, every state has elected women to represent them in Washington, and Congress has a record number of women. That includes me, the very first woman to represent Mississippi in Congress. Women are already protected from discrimination under the law through the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which ensures equal protection under the law. Women's rights are also protected by the Equal Pay Act of 1963, the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, and more. The Equal Rights Amendment would only muddy the waters. Because of its vague language, it would work to undo many of these great achievements, and it does not allow for any distinction between men and women even when it would make sense to do so based on biological differences. I'm particularly concerned about the privacy and the safety for women and girls that the Equal Rights Amendment would destroy. Locker rooms, prisons, hospital rooms, domestic violence shelters, and restrooms would allow men into areas where women should feel safe and protected and have privacy. Advocates, advocates of the ERA are also no longer shy about their goal to use ERA to impose unrestricted abortion on demand up to the moment of birth across the nation and to enforce taxpayers to pay for this. Their apparent goal is to use ERA to overturn the Dobbs decision that returned the issue of abortion to the legislative process and instead re-empower unelected judges to impose a radical abortion policy that is in line with China and North Korea. Even the most modest pro-life protections like waiting periods, parental involvement laws, and restrictions on late-term abortions or partial birth abortions when the babies really feel this pain could be struck down by the ERA. Beyond the problematic content in the amendment, all senators should be offended of the blatant disrespect for the legislative process with this effort to resurrect this long expired amendment. The legitimate constitutional role of Congress in the constitutional amendment proceed process ended when Congress submitted the Equal Rights Amendments to the states on March the 22nd, 1972. In Idaho versus Freeman, Federal District Judge Marion Callister held that Article 5 does not permit Congress to extend a ratification deadline, writing that once the proposal is made, Congress is not at liberty to change it. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a long proponent of the Equal Rights Amendment, said in 2020, I would like to see a new beginning. I'd like it to start over. Congress has no power to go back in time and resurrect an expired constitutional amendment like the ERA. Under Article 5, however, Congress may again propose the same or modified language addressing the same subject and try to approve a new joint resolution with the required two-thirds votes in each House of Congress. The 1972 Equal Rights Amendment would harm the rights of women and weaken the United States 
Constitution. I call on my colleagues to reject this unconstitutional and misguided effort. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hyde-Smith. <laughs> Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, to Ranking Member Graham, to members of the committee. It is, it is good to be here today to testify about this ERA resolution, a resolution that Senator Cardin and I have introduced for three Congresses now. Three Congresses, we have introduced this same language to put before colleagues here. I want to thank Senator Cardin for his leadership in advocating for equal rights for women year over year over year. And I really am glad that we're able to get before the committee here today, at least since I've been working on this issue. I think there's been a surprising lack of attention by by the Senate on this. In fact, uh, as I talk to so many people, they say, well, we thought that the Equal Rights Amendment had already been adopted. They actually believe that we've taken care of. I'm gonna speak quickly on our resolutions contents and some of the process issues, uh, but I'd like to spend most of my time talking about why the resolution is important and why the Equal Rights Amendment is still needed. I think you, Mr. Chairman, have outlined uh, much of the process here, and Senator Cardin has spoken to, to the, very, the very clear and I think um, uh, very, very direct uh, language that is included within the Equal Rights Amendment. It is not convoluted, it is not vague, it is very clear that what we're talking about is advocating equal rights for women under the law. SJ Res 4 removes the deadline for ratification by the states. It clears the hurdle for the archivist to publish and certify the ERA. It also affirms that the ERA has been ratified by three-fourths of the states after Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the amendment back in 2020. And I know that there is debate about the authority of Congress to remove that deadline. Uh, it's been noted by Senator Graham uh, whether or not that the ERA has been ratified by the 38 states given later rescission by, by five of them. What we're trying to do with this resolution, some may say is, is a little novel, but what we're trying to say here is what has happened in the states should not die here in the Senate. The fact is there's no law, there's no Supreme Court president that says that our resolution is somehow unconstitutional or something that can't, Congress cannot do. So putting aside all that, I, I do look forward to, to what the committee will, will hear in this next panel about these issues. But I would like to just give a few statistics in terms of why I think the Equal Rights Amendment is still needed, why it is not redundant. According to the 2020 Census, women are about half, 50.5% of the U.S. population. Compare this to the makeup of the Senate, 25 of us, 25 percent of us are women, as Senator Hyde Smith has noted, that's a record number. A record 128 women are serving in the House, but this is still only 29 percent of the chamber's total. I don't think we're there yet. I'm not satisfied with that. This committee, you've been very active in processing judicial nominations, so just look at the nominations for the federal bench. 38 percent of active district court judges are women, 66 of 170 active circuit court judges are women. That's 39%. So we're making some progress. We're making some progress. That's good. Is it good enough? Shouldn't be good enough. In the private sector, only about 10% of Fortune 500 companies have women CEOs. And this is the first time in history a double-digit number has been reached. Notably and significantly, in 2021, Women earned about 82 cents for every dollar men earned, certainly less than that in many states. Peeling back the layers of the onion, the gender pay gap was even greater for full-time female managers who earned an estimated 70 cents for 77 cents for every dollar earned by full-time male managers. Now we know 
We know that things have improved over the years, but we still have a long ways to go when it comes to achieving equality for women. And I think that we need the Equal Rights Amendment to get there. I'm very proud of the fact that in Alaska, we ratified the ERA in 1972, the same year that it passed the House and the Senate and was signed by President Carter. A few months later, Alaskans amended the state constitution to prohibit discrimination based on sex. Mr. Chairman, women should have equal treatment to men under the law and Congress should do all that it can to ensure that the ERA is finally made part of the Constitution. I think it's long overdue. Senator Graham has mentioned that he's looking forward to the debate here to, to have a discussion about the potential effect of this resolution. I would suggest to you that the potential effect of this resolution is, in, is to ensure equal treatment under the law for women in this country. Thank you. I thank the committee. Um, it's a little late for me to bring this up, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I, I ask those who are our guests here today and members of the audience to refrain from um, uh, any type of interruption of the proceeding if, if they can on both sides. I thank everybody who's here uh, for attending, but we're going to try to keep this at a certain centrist level of dis debate for fairness on both sides. Let me thank my colleagues for coming, Senator Cardin, Senator Hyde-Smith, Senator Murkowski. We know you have a busy schedule, but we think your contribution to this con conversation on the Equal Rights Amendment is historic and important. Thank you for joining us. We're now going to bring the second panel to the uh, committee. We welcome five witnesses. I will introduce the majority witnesses and turn to Ranking Member Graham to introduce the minority witnesses. We have a slight change in the program. Our first witness is going to be Illinois Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, who serves as my state's 48th Lieutenant Governor. She previously served as a member of the Illinois House of Representatives, where she worked to ratify the ERA in Illinois. Lieutenant Governor Stratton is joining us remotely because unfortunately we learned this morning she tested pos positive for COVID-19. I'm grateful she's still able to participate. We also are joined by Thursday Williams. Ms. Williams is a board member of the ERA Coalition and a former cast member of a Broadway show, What the Constitution Means to Me. Our final majority witness is Kathleen Sullivan, currently serving as senior counsel at Quinn Emanuel and previously served as dean of the Stanford Law School. Let me turn to ranking member Graham to introduce his witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have Ms. Lippis Foley. Professor Foley is a tenured professor and teaches constitutional law, civil procedure and healthcare law at Florida International University College of Law. She went to the University of Tennessee to get her JD and Harvard for her master's. She is of counsel at Baker Hosteller, where her practice focuses on jurisdiction, separation of powers, appellate practice. She's a frequent media commentator, has published three books on constitutional law, has authored and co-authored numerous amicus briefs before the U.S. Supreme Court. She serves on the Florida Advisory Committee of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, on the editorial board of the Cato Supreme Court Review and the Research Advisory Board of the James Madison Institute. She is also a member of the American Health Lawyers Association, the American Bar Association. Uh, she previously served as a uh, member of the Committee on Embryonic Still, uh, Stem Cell Guidelines at the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, was a Fulbright Scholar at the College of Law of the National University of Ireland. Miss Jennifer Bracarius is a lawyer, columnist, political analyst. She is a graduate of Harvard Law School. She was an editor on the Law Review at Harvard. She is the director of the Independent Women's Law Center, a project of the Independent Women's Forum. The organization defends free speech, due process, educational freedom, and the continued legal relevance of biological sex. Mr. Bras Mrs. Braceras is an expert on Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972. 
She has also been widely published by numerous networks and previously uh, by numerous networks and previously taught courses on civil rights, constitutional law at Boston College Law School and Suffolk University Law School. She's former member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights and former trustee of the University of Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Graham. Uh, let me lay out the mechanics for the hearing. After I swear in the witnesses, each witness will have five minutes to provide an opening statement, then a round of questions. Each senator has five minutes uh, to ask questions, and I ask all to remain to try to remain within their allotted time. So I'd ask those who are physically present to approach the witness table uh, and stay standing for just one moment while I administer the oath. And I, I hope Lieutenant Governor Stratton is uh, remotely joining us, and she will join in this uh, oath taking. If you please raise your right hand, do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses have answered in the affir affirmative, and I'm going to uh, first defer to Lieutenant Governor Stratton for her opening statement. Let's hope that this is working. Lieutenant Governor, are you with us? Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and the distinguished members of the Senate Judiciary Committee for the opportunity to testify before you virtually today. My name is Juliana Stratton. I am the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Illinois. I am the mother of four daughters, and I use she, her pronouns. I am honored to be here today on this final day of Black History Month and on the eve of Women's History Month to do my part in a fight that started long before me. I stand upon the shoulders of women like Sojourner Truth and Ida B. Wells, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many others who paved the way for the rights of all women. They sacrificed so much to push us forward, and yet we still live in a country that does not guarantee we should be protected from discrimination in the Constitution. An explicit assertion that we are all equals is still missing, despite the women lawmakers across the nation who stood up to finish the work our foremothers started. In May 2018, I was one of those women. As a state representative, I joined a bipartisan vote for Illinois to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. I made it clear to my colleagues in the Illinois House that gender equality and racial equality are not a zero-sum game, that we are all lifted up when everyone's rights are protected. We live with the stark reality that despite being the most educated demographic in the United States, black women are only paid 64 cents for every dollar paid to white men. There should be stronger remedies to make sure women, all women, are paid an equal wage based on their abilities and qualifications and without discrimination based on sex. These protections will be of particular significance to women of color who face more workplace discrimination than their white counterparts. And despite impressive recovery efforts, the COVID-19 pandemic has deepened economic disparities that have already harmed women for generations. The recovery for jobs traditionally held by women have lagged woefully behind the jobs often worked by men. Also, women are twice as likely as men to work in low paying occupations, and this rate is even higher for black women and Latinas. On top of this, we are seeing the eroding of women's rights and their ability to determine what is best for their futures. Recent events have shown us all too well how easily decades of progress can be erased when our rights are not guaranteed by the Constitution. Every parent wants their child to have a better life, and that was certainly true for my late mother, Velma, who spent every day doing what she could to ensure doors of opportunity were open to me and her four children. And now I have a responsibility to my daughters, Tyler, Cassidy, Ryan, and Mackenzie, to honor my mother's legacy and ensure they can go even farther on this journey toward equality and justice, not just for them,
but for young women and girls everywhere who deserve nothing less. Make no mistake, should the ERA pass, it will not guarantee that women will be treated equally overnight. We all know, for example, that the struggle continues for racial justice and equal rights for black people and other people of color under the 14th Amendment. And women will also need to remain vigilant. We need a firm foundation for equality that is long overdue. Finishing this work is as important as ever to acknowledge the rights that women who make up over half the population so deserve. So I urge Congress when taking action to consider your mothers, your daughters, and the women in your districts. It's time to make real a vision 100 years in the making so that our daughters and our granddaughters and the next generation of women are seen as exactly who they are, equals. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Our next witness, I hope, help me pronounce your name, Braceres, correct? Ms. Jennifer Perceres, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman You need to turn your microphone on. <coughs> Slide your finger over the red light. It should work. I hope it does. No. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of Independent Women's Law Center, and as the mother of four children, including three daughters, I am here to warn you, the ERA is a Trojan horse. It promises equality, but hidden inside the empty rhetoric is a laundry list of policies that will harm women and girls. Back when the ERA was introduced in the House in 1971, I asked the Capitol Police to enforce Let's try to maintain order uh, so we can get through this proceeding and have all points of view expressed. The, the people who have been locked out of this process, frankly, are the 62% of American voters who either weren't born or were too young to vote when the ERA expired in 1979. But as I was saying, when the ERA was introduced in the House in <coughs> 1971, it was still lawful to deny women credit, to refuse to sell or rent housing to women, to sexually harass women at work and at school, and to bar them from certain schools or certain fields of study. Millions of Americans supported the ERA at that time as a solution to these problems. Frankly, I might have too, had I been more than three years old. But 52 years later, I'm happy to say that sex discrimination and sexual harassment are illegal in the United States of America. And public policies that treat one sex less favorably than the other are already unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause. Today, my three daughters and my son are legally equal. Indeed, so much has changed since the 1970s that even the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg believed that when it comes to the law, quote, there is no practical difference between what has evolved and the ERA. The ERA is therefore unnecessary in 2023, but that is precisely why it is so dangerous. 
To begin with, the ERA does not define the word sex. In 1971, there was no need to. We all knew that it meant biological sex. Today, ideologues are actively trying to redefine the term to include gender identity. And there can be no doubt that they will use the ERA to constitutionally mandate the ability of male prisoners to self-identify into women's facilities, taxpayer funding of puberty blockers for trans-identified teens, and the participation of biological males on women's sports teams. But even if the ERA did define the phrase sex consistent with biology, the amendment would still jeopardize many single-sex spaces we take for granted. <laughs> Layering the ERA on top of the Equal Protection Clause could suggest that it requires something more, and it might imply that it forbids public policies that ever distinguish between males and females. But males and females are not the same. We never will be. And our laws and public policies shouldn't treat us as if we're interchangeable. Do members of this committee really want to constitutionally forbid public schools from offering single-sex sports teams, sexual assault support groups, or even fraternities and sororities? Do you want to outlaw grants to female-owned businesses or grants that encourage women and girls in STEM? Because make no mistake, by applying the strictest constitutional scrutiny to sex-based programs, this is what the ERA will achieve. But it gets worse. The ERA has the potential to outlaw not only single-sex spaces, but all sex disparities, or so its proponents claim. But what if the disparities favor women? Women today earn the majority of bachelor's and master's degrees. Should state schools be forced to discriminate against women in order to achieve parity in all programs? Should the government be required not only to draft women, but to draft them and send them into combat in equal numbers as men? Shouldn't we at least let the state legislators who represent today's voters debate and vote on the merits of these policies before we force them on an unsuspecting public? The ERA would be devastating not only to women and girls, but also to religious liberty, threatening the tax-exempt status of religious groups that ordain only men and prohibit federal funding of religious organizations that counsel young people about biological sex differences. Americans could certainly choose to amend the Constitution to do any of these things, but at no point have 38 states agreed to an amendment that would do these things, and Congress cannot now dissolve the ERA's ratification deadline and claim that they have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Braceres. Ms. Williams. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the Committee on the Judiciary. My name is Thursday Williams. I am currently a senior at Trinity College in Connecticut, and I serve on the board of the ERA Coalition. It is such an honor to be here today testifying on behalf of the Equal Rights Amendment. Thank you, Senator Durbin, for inviting me to share my story of why the Equal Rights Amendment is important to me, my peers, and the future generation. We are at a tipping point. The future of our democracy is at stake. The ERA holds the promise of a brighter future for us all. My family came to this country from Jamaica seeking the American dream of education and productivity, and my mission is to fulfill that dream. I proudly became a citizen, was accepted into a competitive college, took on leadership roles, became president of Trinity College Black Women's Organization, and engaged in spirited debates about rights and freedom. I fell in love with the United States Constitution in high school when I participated in constitutional debates through the Legal Outreach Program. I argued multiple constitutional issues at NYU and Brooklyn Law School, including the Equal Protection Clause, the Fourth Amendment, and voting rights. What I love the most about the Constitution is how brilliantly it was designed to adapt to the changing needs of its people. Our founding fathers were visionaries. They understood that we needed a document that can endure throughout generations. 
That's when I knew this was the thing for me. I wanted to study law. I wanted to be one of the change makers. During my senior year of high school, I had the opportunity to perform in an award-winning Broadway play, What the Constitution Means to Me. Each night, I debated why we should keep the United States Constitution. There was a part in the play where I was talking about inequality, and I was thinking about the fact that not so long ago, I would have been considered property. Not so long ago, I wouldn't even have had the opportunity to stand on stage as a black woman. In my closing argument during one performance, I stopped mid-show and I just stood there crying my eyes out at the idea. Here I am defending a constitution that at one point considered me three-fifths of a person. A constitution that doesn't explicitly recognize women in it. A constitution that in 2023 still doesn't explicitly state that I am equal to a man. For the first time, it became clear to me that this document was not written for me. Nevertheless, I will continue to defend this constitution and I will fight for my rightful place in it. This is why I'm here today. I am here to defend an amendment that would finally guarantee me equality. After graduating in May, I will be starting my professional career at one of the most prestigious law firms in the country. As exciting as this should be, I proceed with caution because I am aware that although I am as capable as any man, the system is stacked against me. As a woman of color, I am more likely to be offered less than a man for the same work. I am more likely to be overlooked for raises and promotions. I will have to work twice as hard to get the same recognition as my male colleagues. And right now, I will have limited recourse to fight against it. This is why it is important for myself, my peers, and the future generation to have the Equal Rights Amendment. We deserve a constitution that guarantees equality regardless of sex. A constitution that we can use as a tool to fight discrimination. The Equal Rights Amendment has fulfilled all requirements to be added to the constitution. Now it is time for it to be recognized. If we continue to hold back more than half of our people from accessing equal opportunities, what does that say about us as a country? How can we be the beacon of freedom and democracy we claim to be if we do not declare that sex discrimination contradicts the American dream? The ERA will make the Constitution a more perfect document so we can have a more perfect union. It is time we stop disappointing the future generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. Professor Foley? Thank you, Chairman Durbin. Uh, Ranking Member Graham, members of the committee, I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify about this important issue. And uh, as a constitutional law professor and someone who practices constitutional law, I'm gonna stick to the law. Um, okay, so let's talk about Article 5 of the Constitution. Article 5 of the Constitution gives pa uh, Congress an express power to propose constitutional amendments, including a power to propose their mode of ratification and Congress usually does this via a joint resolution. Once that joint resolution passes by two-thirds supermajorities as required by Article 5, Congress's role under the Constitution is done. It's exercised all the power that it has under Article 5. And in fact, it is the entire joint resolution, including its preamble, that is then submitted to the states for ratification. The joint resolution that you would pass uh, in your Article 5 capacity is the proposal itself. So preambles are therefore not only a part of the Article 5 proposal, they are often an important part because they often contain the mode of ratification. So let me give you a quick example. When Congress passed the Bill of Rights proposal, 
the preamble specified that those amendments, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, those amendments mode of ratification must be by state legislatures rather than state conventions. And the 23rd through 26th amendments, like the ERA, contain a seven year ratification deadline in their preambles. So let's talk about the case law now. Uh, we've already mentioned Dillon versus Gloss. This is the most important Supreme Court case. The court there unanimously held that a seven year ratification deadline that was contained in the 18th Amendment, the Prohibition Amendment, was judicially enforceable because it was an exercise of Congress's power to propose a mode of ratification under Article 5. Now, ERA proponents prefer to kind of ignore Dillon, and they focus instead on a plurality opinion that was penned by Justice Black in the 1939 decision in Coleman versus Miller. Now, Black's plurality in Coleman took the position, like the ERA proponents do now, that all ratification issues are non-justiciable political questions that Congress alone can resolve, not the courts. But of course, we all know, most of us in the room are lawyers, the black plurality is just that. It's a plurality, it got four votes. The other five justices in Coleman, the majority of the court, took a narrower view and held that Congress alone can decide if, if an amendment has been ratified in a timely fashion, and importantly, it can do so by specifying a ratification deadline in its proposal. If there's no ratification period specified by Congress in its proposal, like with the child labor amendment, which was what, issue, uh, what was as at issue in Coleman, then the court won't sort of superimpose one. The amendment will remain open indefinitely for ratification. And that's what happened, for example, with the 27th Amendment, which took 203 years to ratify and was ultimately ratified in 1992 after being one of James Madison's original 12 articles proposed. So women get seven years and congressional pay raises get Please. Two years. Restore order. For to hide behind this the fact that the ERA is ratified, it's ready, and must be published right now. This is illegal. This is a fraud. Women have equal rights right now. 38 states ratified the amendment. It must be published. This is your right. Congress is role in over of the ERA Biden. Fight the fraud. Sorry, Professor Foley, please, please proceed. Yeah, no worries. All right, so if Congress does specify a ratification deadline in its proposal, like it did with the 18th Amendment in Dillon and like it has done with the ERA, then the court will in fact enforce that deadline. And either way, notice that Congress is the one in control. Uh, it can define the terms that it wants in its proposal that it uh, initially submits to the states. Now, given the Supreme Court precedent, it should be unsurprising that we have two district court opinions that have both held that the ERA's ratification deadline is, in fact, enforceable. There was the Idaho v. Freeman case, which I think uh, uh, someone mentioned earlier, and from 1981. And then most recently, we have the Virginia v. Ferrero case from the um, D.C. District Court in 2021. Both of these courts have expressly rejected the argument that the ERA's ratification deadline is ineffective because it's in the preamble. In Ferrero, for example, Judge Contreras, who's an Obama appointee, held that the ERA's deadline was operative and not precatory. So unlike the Constitution's preamble or preambles in ordinary statutes, the ERA's deadline doesn't use flowery language that doesn't have some sort of discernible standard. It's operative language. Moreover, and importantly, I think, Congress and the states have a very long-standing history of treating the mode of ratification that's contained in a preamble as binding. I gave you the previous example of the Bill of Rights preamble. This history is entitled to great weight and has been by courts. And finally, Ferrero's ratification analysis isn't dicta as some of the ERA proponents uh, claim. Judge Contreras expressly stated twice in his opinion that his conclusions both on standing and ratification were what he called alternate holdings. And as lawyers in the room know, it's black letter law that alternate holdings are not dicta. My written testimony cites numerous cases, including Supreme Court cases on this. 
If Congress can recognize ratification outside of proposal's uh, specified deadline, then think about it. Congress will have a vast new power that is not contemplated under Article 5 or any other part of the Constitution. Congress could specify one mode of proposal in the actual proposal that it submits to the states, and then years or even centuries later, it could alter the mode of proposal by a simple majoritarian resolution. The constitutional amendment process would no longer be fixed and stable, but it would be a chaotic, ever-moving target. This wouldn't be fair to the states, and it would effectively gut Article 5's supermajoritarian process. So I would urge opposition to Senate Resolution 4 or any similar proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Foley. Ms. Sullivan? Thank you so much, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee. It's a privilege to be before this committee, which I first had as a privilege 37 years ago, which is a sobering thing to think about. I am delighted to have this opportunity to speak in support of Senate Joint Resolution 4 from the perspective of a constitutional scholar. And I'd like to respectfully disagree with my learned colleague, Professor Foley, on a several points, but I'd like to really focus on three points today. First, I want to echo the points made so eloquently in the opening panel by Senators Cardin and Murkowski that this ERA is very much a bipartisan enterprise, and it has been since its inception 100 years ago. It was authored by Republican as well as Democratic authors. It was proposed in a bipartisan fashion, and it was ratified in bipartisan fashion. It was great Republican congresswomen who reached across the aisle to Democratic congresswomen to propose the ERA in 1972, and it's been bipartisan right through the ratifications by Illinois, Nevada, and Virginia. Second point, I would like to echo the chairman's eloquent words about why the ERA is not redundant of existing equal protection jurisprudence as announced by the court. It's not redundant. Uh, it, it's true we have had, as all of my colleagues have said, we've had advances for women, very important advances over the last 50 years, but they're not guaranteed in the Constitution. And under the current Supreme Court's approach to interpreting the 14th Amendment and the other Civil War amendments, uh, they look to history. And I can tell you that the history of the, fa of the framing of the 14th Amendment was not surrounded by the view that women were the equal of men. And don't take it from me, you can take it from the Supreme Court, which upheld in Bradwell against Illinois in 1872, a few short years after the 14th Amendment, the power of Illinois to exclude women from the practice of law, or the Supreme Court in Minor versus Happersett, an 1874 decision in which the Supreme Court held women did not have an equal right to vote with men under either the Equal Protection or the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. So if we look to 1868 to see what the Equal Protection Clause means, we're not going to find that it protected the equality of women to men. That's why the ERA is not redundant. That's why it should be enacted now. That's why it should be affirmed now. Uh, it's my belief that under Article 5, Congress proposed it, 38 states ratified it. It is the law now, and the only thing standing away, standing in the way, is the congressional deadline which Congress set in 1972, altered in 1978, and has the power to change today. And that's what I want to end on. My third point, and the most important point for today, is to absolutely affirm, from a perspective of a constitutional scholar who's looked at Article 5, that this body has the power to remove the deadline that was set in 1972 and extended in 1978. Now, why does the Congress have constitutional authority to eliminate the deadline? Well, uh, for, to begin with, there's already a body of, of, of precedent in this body. The, this body decided it had the power to extend the deadline in 1978 and did so on the advice of the executive branch, an Office of Legal Counsel memo at the time. But the most important reason why you have this power, and here I want to respectfully disagree with my friend Professor Foley, is the prior deadline was in the preamble and not in the text. Now over time, Congress has had a different approach to where it put these deadlines. 
It put a deadline in the text of the 18th Amendment, the Prohibition Amendment, and it said it shall be inoperative unless adopted. And when it went out to the states for ratification, the states voted on that language. That was an expiration date. What this body said in 1972 for, for the ERA could not have been more different. It just said it shall be the amendment, uh, part of the Constitution, uh, if, uh, when, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the state within seven years. That was advisory, it was hortatory, it was something that expressed the wish of the body then, but it can be changed. Now here's the key point. When the, Congre when the framers wanted to put time limits in the Constitution, they knew how to do it. Six years for a term of office, two years for a term of office, four years for a presidential term of office. The pocket veto clause, Article 1, Section 7, if any bill shall not be returned by the president within 10 days after it shall be, have been presented, it sh the same shall be law. There is no time limit in Article 5. And when this body adopted a time limit in the preamble by joint resolution and majority vote, it set the president for this body now today to decide by joint resolution through majority vote to change the deadline, to remove the deadline. And that is why Senate Joint Resolution Number 4 is proper, it's constitutional, it's within this body's power, and it will make clear and undisputable that the Equal Rights Amendment is now the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We now will turn to questions, and each member has five minutes. I'm going to try to ask two questions <laughs> to clarify, I think, two important issues. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, Ms. Sullivan, uh, and I, I want to go to this preamble question. Uh, Professor Foley noted Article 5 uh, in her uh, presentation to the committee. I looked at Article 5. There is no mention of the word preamble in Article 5. I look, of course, to the preamble to the Constitution, and as memorable as the words may be, I don't believe that they have driven decisions uh, of the court or at, at any stage. The body of the Constitution does over and over again. I can't recall, maybe I'm just not uh, aware of it, the preamble has been a driving force to establish or to question a person's rights. And of course, this Constitution in Article 7 spells out exactly what ratification of the Constitution entails. And again, we have an important paragraph which does not include the word preamble at any, any stage. So my question to you uh, initially is, the argument that uh, this is in a preamble and should be treated differently than other places, you've stated already, but what, what is your comment on the preamble to the Constitution and the fact that it has not been a driving force? Preambles can have eloquent power. The preamble to the Constitution is perhaps the greatest preamble ever written. But preambles do not drive the interpretation of Article 5 joint resolutions, and, and they, they never did and no court has ever declared it. And crucially, I want to focus on Dillon versus Gloss, which Senator Graham mentioned earlier, 1921 decision that, of course, did hold that the 18th Amendment was not uh, uh, unconstitutional by virtue of the seven-year expiration date that was baked into it and ratified by the states. That, crucially, was not a preamble. It was the language the seven-year deadline was an expiration date in the text. Now, why does that matter? It matters because the states vote on the text of the amendment. When they ratify, the states are not ratifying the preamble. They are ratifying the text. So it's one thing to bake the deadline into the constitutional text and have the states vote on it. That might be binding. But a preamble is just advisory. It's your dialogue with the state saying, get this done in seven years, but maybe we'll revisit it. And if anything, the language of Coleman versus Miller, the 1939 case, is supportive of the view that the Congress does have the power now to say we think the ERA is still vital and we think we should remove the prior deadline. One Congress can't entrench itself into the future by binding a future Congress. One Congress can't prevent the states from exercising their ratification role by setting a binding deadline on the states enforceable by a court. So just to, there's no constitutional decision by the Supreme Court standing in your way. Dillon versus Gloss is in apposite because it was about a deadline in the text and not the preamble. And Coleman versus Miller is supportive of this Congress's role in deciding 
that the ERA still has a vital role to play today. So let me go to a second question that was raised by Professor Foley as well as uh, by Senator Graham. Since Congress sent the resolution proposing inclusion of the ERA in the Constitution to the states in March of 72, as we know, 38 states have ratified the amendment. However, five of those states have subsequently sought to rescind their ratification. Nebraska, 1973, Tennessee, 74, Idaho, 77, Kentucky, 78, and South Dakota in 79. North Dakota also recently voted to rescind its uh, ratification in 2021. What is the legal significance, Ms. Sullivan, of these state legislatures voting to rescind their ratifications? It has no, a state rescission has no force under the text of Article 5, which speaks of ratification and not of rescission. Number two, when two states tried to withdraw or rescind their ratification of the 14th Amendment after it was proposed and adopted, uh, this body rejected that. So there's precedent in this body for rejecting efforts by to, to rescind. And to the extent this body has the power I described before, this body has the power to affirm that those rescissions are ineffective now, just as they were for the 14th Amendment. We wouldn't have had the 14th Amendment today if we'd listened to rescissions. Thank you very much. Senator Graham. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Give me a little bit of latitude, if you don't mind. There's sort of some breaking news here. Uh, apparently, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals just affirmed the holding, uh, I think, is it Virginia versus Ferraro? Is that the name of it? Yes, that's the name of it. Illinois so now. Let me give me a second to set the stage, Mr. Chairman, if you, if you don't mind. So you had two states basically sue in district court who ratified the ERA after the time period in question, compelling the National Archivist to enroll it in the Constitution. Is that generally what they were suing about, Ms. Foley? Well, I don't know. I haven't read the opinion yet since the No, I, I'm Illinois <laughs> and Nevada brought a lawsuit yeah. in the district court. Correct. Saying their ratification after 1982 was should valid. count and get you to 38. And the district court said no. Is that correct? That's correct. They sought a writ of mandamus to force the U.S. archivist uh, to uh, publish. So the district court upheld the idea that we, the Congress, could set deadlines, which we did in this case. Correct. Citing Dillon. Okay. So today, the D.C. Court of Appeals rejected the mandamus request and upheld the lower court. So that's where we're at at like 11 or whatever time it is. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is that the reason we're not starting over and we're trying to turn the Constitution, in my opinion, upside down, is if you started this process today, you wouldn't come anywhere near two-thirds of the House and Senate to ratify this amendment. And you all all know that. Times have changed. Women's rights have been acknowledged. And why it would be so soundly rejected, this amendment would lead to chaos. This amendment would really punish women who are trying to play sports fairly. This amendment would give the court the ability to strike down every pro-life measure passed by the states. And if you don't believe me, this is what the NARAL said. Sent out a national alert. The ERA, what we're debating here today, would reinforce the constitutional right to abortion. It would require judges to strike down anti-abortion laws. Ms. Barkarius, do you agree with their position? Yes, I do. Ms. Sullivan, do you agree with their position? that NARAL is saying if the ERA were passed, become a constitutional amendment, it would allow courts to strike down all restrictions on abortion that exist in the states today based on the ERA. Senator, I, I, I respectfully do not agree so with that. So you disagree that, with NARAL? I do on that point, on that prediction. Okay. I, I think that so, there would be a case-by-case case case determination that would balance the right to women's equality against other rights, which is how we practice the constitutional a law every day, right. Senator. The ACLU wrote the House in March of 2021. The Equal Rights Amendment could provide an additional layer of protection against restrictions on abortion. 
it could be a tool against further uh, erosion of reproductive rights. Do you agree with that, Ms. Berceris? I, I certainly do, and I, I mean, certainly that's what the proponent, the proponents of the RA okay, want so to do. So let's just be way. honest. The people who are pushing politically to pass this are hanging their head on if it became law, every pro-life measure in this country would fall. You didn't say that in 1982. So if there is a law in a state, pick a state, that says a biological male cannot compete against females, would that law be subject to being struck down if the ERA is passed, Ms. Berserius? Yes, it would. In fact, I would add that in my home state of Massachusetts, where we have a state equal rights amendment, um, schools are required to allow boys to compete in women's sports. And as a result, my daughter, who is a now a Division I field hockey player, in her senior year of high school, um, she her team competed against at least three teams that had more than three men on them, um, as is their constitutional right in Massachusetts. So if gender identity becomes the new standard under strict... Oh, and this isn't gender identity. These, these were not trans-identified... Right individuals these were boys who identify as boys and were very good athletes in hockey and lacrosse and thought wouldn't it be fun and or funny to go out and play field hockey against a bunch of girls some of whom are were future division one athletes so i'll just and wrap take their spots on varsity teams yeah i'll just wrap this up mr chairman the reason it wouldn't get two-thirds votes most americans don't like the outcome we're talking about here most americans would be really upset to have a constitutional amendment that would do the things we're talking about. Mandate abortion on demand up to the moment of birth. That's what it would do. And the people pushing it, that's what they want. And if you can't pull this rabbit out of a hat constitutional exercise and count the states, uh, not count the ones that rescinded, count the ones that did after the time period, and you had to start over as Justice Ginsburg indicated, you would fail miserably. Because the times in which we live have changed. You wouldn't get anywhere near two thirds vote in the Senate or the House, because most members of Congress, and I think a majority of senators, do not want a constitutional amendment that requires abortion on demand up to the moment of birth. I think most members of the House and most members of the Senate, most members of the House and most members of the Senate would be offended by a law, a constitutional amendment mandating that biological males can take over girls' sports. That's why you would fail so miserably. Have a good day. Bye. So, uh, look, if Senator from South Carolina, bear with me, I see this opinion that you've re referenced uh, in your statement, and as I understand it, the circuit court was affirming what the district court had decided, that the court itself was not going to overturn the, this decision which puts the ball right smack dab back in Congress court. Uh, yeah, yes, sir, that's right. So, and the point is that the courts have upheld the position of the district judge. And what I am saying, no, it doesn't put it back. The law of the land is that seven years plus three years is the limit. And we're not buying into what you're selling here. No, we don't agree with that. And so let me tell you the sequence of members who will be called on based on the early bird rule. First, Senator Whitehouse, then Senator Grassley, Klobuchar, then Senator Lee, and the list goes on from there. So let's start with Senator Whitehouse. Thanks, Chairman. Um, it's always interesting to me to figure out who's here in the room. So if you don't mind, um, Ms. Braceras, I'd like to ask you a few questions about the um, Independent Women's Law Center. Sure. What is its relationship with the Independent Women's Forum and the Independent Women's Voice organizations? 
We are the legal advocacy arm of the Independent Women's Forum and Independent Women's Voice. So they share support for the organization that you are here representing together? Correct. We're, we're a part of Independent Women's Forum. Okay. I'm sorry, you're a part of Independent Women's Forum or you're a part of Independent Women's Voice? We're a part of, um, well, both. Okay. Got it. What else do Independent Women's Forum and Independent Women's Voice share? Do they share officers? I'd be happy to respond to those questions in writing. I don't really have the corporate structure in front of me right now. You don't um, know if they share officers or we, not? We have overlapping employees, some, not all. Okay, so you have you share staff, some staff, correct? Correct. You're not sure whether you share officers or not, but you'll get that to me in writing, correct? If you'd like. I would like. Do you share donors? I have no idea. I'm, I'm an employee. I'm not a part of the fundraising okay. arm. Could we add that to the questions you'll get back to me in writing on, whether you share, whether you organizations share donors? Sure. I, I'm, I'm quite sure they don't share donations. Uh, individuals may donate to either Independent Women's Voice, Independent Women's Forum, or both. Um, but, but no, they don't share the donations. But they may have the same donors, correct? It's possible. That's what you'll let me know, correct? Sure. And uh, office space, do they share office space? We're a virtual office. We have been since long before COVID, actually. We are staff almost entirely of women. And um, for a variety of reasons, our organizations made the decision long ago to uh, allow our staff to work from home. What distinctions would we find between the office arrangements for Independent Women's Voice and Independent Women's Forum? Well, as I said, we're, we're both virtual companies. So there's no, no difference between the office there is no office for either There is no office for either of them. There's no physical office. There is you no do get physical together, office. you have meetings, you do Zooms, you do phone calls, all of that sort of thing that offices do, correct? Correct. And when you do that, is there a distinction between whether it's being done by Independent Women's Voice or Independent Women's Forum? Um, yes, depending on the meeting. I mean, if, if IWF policy staff calls a meeting, then it's a meeting of the IWF policy staff. Okay. Um, the history of your organization, as I understand it, is that um, Independent Women's Forum was led from 2000, and 2000, 2000 to 2005 by Coke Industries lobbyist Nancy Fotenhauer. I don't know if I pronounced that name right, but is that true? Nancy Fotenhauer was president of IWF for a time period. I don't have the exact dates in front of me. And as I understand it, in 2003, she was also president of Americans for Prosperity, which is the Coke organization's primary political battleship, I would call it, entity. I have no idea, Senator, and I'm, I'm pleased that you're so interested in the work of IWF. I hope that you'll ask the other um, panelists here today and other panelists that come before you on other well, there are more mysteries around, questions. I think there are more mysteries your around yours than the others, so if you don't mind, well, there's I'll no mystery about IWF. It originated as Women for Judge Thomas, correct? Yes, it did. Founded by Ricky Silverman, who had um, been co-chair or vice chair of the EEOC with Justice Thomas. And the Coke Industries lobbyist ran both those organizations at the same time that she ran Americans for Prosperity. I, for I have years. no idea what you're talking about, a okay. Coke industry lobbyist. I think you're, I, I, I have no knowledge of that. All right. Um, <clears throat> you do take positions on judicial nominees, do you not? We do. Have you ever taken a position in favor of an appointee of a Democratic president? Uh, have I personally, or has the organization? Either organization or yourself, all three. I I'm sure that I have. Okay, uh, let's set that aside then and look at the two organizations, since that's where my question was going. Have they... Well, the organi to, to be honest with you, the organizations um, have, for the most part, only weighed in on Supreme Court nominations. Um, I think there were a Have you ever supported a Democratic nominee? Has either organization ever supported a Democratic nominee to the Supreme Court? Not in my knowledge, no. We, we support the, nominees who support uh, uh, an originalist interpretation of the Constitution. Has the international, this will be my last question, did the international uh, 
in, sorry, the Independent Women's Forum call the uh, testimony here to this committee by Dr. Christine Blasey Ford a publicity stunt. Did the Independent Women's Forum say that? Yeah. I don't recall. Okay. My time's up. Senator Grassley. Uh, Ms. Berseris, uh, Judge Justice Ginsburg quote about the Equal Rights Amendment falling three states short of ramification has already been referred to and she said it should start all over again. Given how rare it is for our history to amend the Constitution, do you agree with Justice Ginsburg that the amendment process should start over to ensure constitutionality and the confidence of the American people? I do, and um, particularly because the circumstances have changed so much that uh, the amendment that is currently before you today is effectively a different amendment than the one that the states voted to approve, that the 35 states voted to approve uh, in, the, in the early 1970s. Um, I would also argue that 62% of the American voters, at least 62%, were not of voting age or were not yet born at the time that the states first considered this amendment. Um, the majority of American voters today are women. And today's women and their elected representatives in the states should have an opportunity to weigh in on whether or not this is necessary in 2023. Uh, the also to you, the Department of Justice issued an opinion that the Equal Rights Amendment has expired. Expired was their word, and it is constitutionally required that the process start again. So can you talk about why this is the case and what effects it would have on the amendment to continue as it stands? And I think you already spoke to that point a little bit, but if you want to expand on it, feel free to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, when, when the amendment fails to garner um, 38 states in the time allotted by Congress, the amendment died. And there's nothing to, there's, there's effectively, um, you're talking about lifting a deadline on something that no longer exists. It, it, it died when it expired in 1979, I would argue. Um, some people argue it expired in 1982, but regardless, it is, it is dead now and therefore cannot be resurrected from the dead. Yeah. Professor Foley, uh, the Supreme Court held that Congress could fix a reasonable time for ratification about an amendment. Congress fixed the time for this constitutional amendment, and of course this expired. Are you aware of any constitutional amendments that were ratified after the deadline for ratification of the amendment? No, this is the only one. Uh, also, do you explain to us whether Congress has the constitutional authority to pass a proposed amendment without a ratification deadline, and then years later impose a ratification deadline before the threshold for state ratification has been satisfied? No, as I said in my testimony, um, you, you know, the only power Congress has is under Article 5, and that is to make a proposal that is submitted to the states. Once that promo proposal is submitted to the states, your job is done and you're locked in. Uh, and you can't change it by simple majoritarian resolutions in the future. So for example, um, your mode of ratification that you choose can include not only a ratification deadline should you choose to impose one, but it can also include and does generally include um, the mode of ratification that's expressly mentioned in Article 5, which is specifying whether the ratification should occur via state legislatures versus state conventions. And um, once you pick state conventions or state legislatures, you're also locked in, just like you're locked in on the deadline. So whatever mode of ratification you pick um, is fixed. Yeah. And my last question will be to you also, Professor Foley. What are the legal risks of disregarding the ratification deadline for this constitutional amendment? Well, I think the biggest problem of all is that if you sort of arrogate to yourself through a majoritarian resolution, um, the, the idea that you have this sort of new power to change the mode of ratification, um, then that means the mode of ratification, including picking state legislatures versus state conventions and any deadline is changeable at whim of any future Congress. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a moment of constitutional instability. 
It's uh, deeply unfair to the states uh, who have always treated your modes of ratification as fixed and binding on them. Um, and it basically guts the supermajoritarian process of Article 5. So I think it's a very dangerous precedent to set. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Next is Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've long supported the Equal Rights Amendment. I guess long is the right adjective to use here. Um, and uh, really appreciated all the testimony, but especially um, Senator Murkowski's willingness uh, to talk about the importance of bipartisan support for this. And I'd start with you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton. Um, could you talk about Illinois, where just in 2018, Illinois ratified the ARA with bipartisan support, including from the House Republican leader, nine other Republicans, and how the ERA gathered that kind of bipartisan support in Illinois and still, in fact, has it uh, nationally? Yes, thank you so much, Senator, for that question. Uh, in 2018, as I served at, in the Illinois House, I was proud to not only vote for the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment in Illinois, but to do so alongside of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. It was a bipartisan vote, and I think that one of the things that uh, was so influential in that debate on the House floor uh, was to talk about the implications, not just for women today, but for women and girls of the next generation and the generations to come. I think I heard a statement uh, in one of the previous speakers talking about what would happen if we needed to wait for every vote, um, wait until we had the next generation to be alive and able to make a vote. Well, certainly that is not something that I would have wanted it's as it relates to the 14th Amendment as a black woman for someone to say, well, let's just wait until the next generation is alive and can vote. I'm grateful that there are votes that can be taken and amendments that can be made to our constitution that enshrine rights that uh, demonstrate that we should be able to live free from discrimination. Thank you. Right now in Illinois. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. I just have a few more questions. We have our little five minutes here. So um, I guess I will go to you, Professor Sullivan. Uh, last year I joined Senator Blumenthal, Cortez Masto, as well as uh, former Representative Maloney, who's here today, returned. Uh, thank you for being here. And Spear in urging the Justice Department to withdraw an opinion issued under the previous administration, uh, seeking to stand in the way of the ERA being added to the Constitution. The Justice Department um, said that the prior opinion did not prevent the Congress, in fact, from taking action related to the ratification of the ERA. Um, do you quickly, do you agree with the Justice Department that there's nothing stopping Congress from taking action regarding the ERA? Yes. Okay. Well, that is nice and succinct. Thank you. Um, the uh, other question I wanted to ask you was that given the Supreme Court's willingness to roll back fundamental rights, do you agree that it is more important than ever to enshrine formal protections in our Constitution guaranteeing women's equality? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and I think that's very important for people to know the moment that we are in time. While this has been going on, as I described it early on, for a long, long time, and women have been fighting for their rights, and it has been, uh, in fact, ratified in so many states, uh, it is all the more relevant today. Um, I guess I would end uh, with you, Ms. Williams. I know in high school you performed on Broadway and what the Constitution means to me. I actually got to personally see the play when it came to Minneapolis. Um, and it was an amazing experience. And I know different high schoolers have performed um, as part of that play uh, for many years. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to tell uh, the committee what a guarantee of equality in the Constitution uh, would mean to you? Yes. Um, so as I've previously uh, mentioned in my testimony, um, in May, I will be um, starting a position as a litigation paralegal at one of the most prestigious um, firms. And I think when thinking about the experience of women and especially black women in this country, it is important for us 
to have tools to fight against discrimination, to have tools that will help us uh, gain, the gain the equality we deserve. As I've said, um, women in this country are not offered as much as men. I will have to work as hard as my male colleagues. I may not receive the same respect as my male colleagues, and I will have limited recourse to fight against that, and I deserve that. As a black woman, I experience this world very differently from each and every person on this committee, and it is important that my perspective and my experience is uh, is, 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 is in this constitution, is in this document. So this is why we need the ERA. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's important to remember that when Congress proposed this amendment in 1972, it didn't happen in a vacuum. When Congress went to propose it, it didn't have the votes that it needed. It added the seven-year limitation in order to secure the consensus necessary to achieve a two-thirds supermajority vote in both houses. In other words, there were members of Congress needed to vote for it who weren't willing to vote for it without that provision. So that's how they achieved the bargain. And we can't just ignore that. That shouldn't be ignored. Uh, you can't ignore it without uh, doing violence to the process articulated in Article 5 of the Constitution for how to amend it. Uh, but it's important anytime we amend the Constitution to make sure that we understand what the language means. We've seen through other amendments, uh, one of many examples would be the 14th Amendment. Um, you can't always anticipate at the outset when you adopt something like this what ramifications it might have. And that's one of the many reasons it's important uh, to get this right. Um, all sorts of things uh, have changed uh, since 1972, and that's yet another uh, prudential reason why it makes sense to put limitations in there. But to be very clear, there is, there is a remedy for what, what you're talking about. When something expires, it's not like it can't ever be brought up again. It's just that it becomes a different proposal. That proposal has a shelf life. That shelf life has now passed. It has expired. Congress could propose another Equal Rights Amendment. It has yet to do so, and that matters. It matters in a way that's been recognized by the courts. The U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia uh, ruled against the position that this can be uh, uh, extended. And the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit today affirmed that ruling. So uh, this argument has lost at the District Court. It has lost at the Court of Appeals. If it were to come before the United States Supreme Court, it, it, it will lose their too. And so uh, that, that really is a significant thing. Um, there are some policy considerations that also need to be taken into account. Uh, in the 1970s, my dad wrote a book. It was called The Lawyer Looks at the Equal Rights Amendment. And he asked a number of questions about the legislation. And one of the questions he asked uh, that he identified as the most important question relates to what standard of review would be applied if the Equal Rights Amendment were to become law of the land. Uh, uh, he asked, for example, is it going to be rational basis? Is it going to be strict scrutiny? Is it going to be intermediate scrutiny? Or, or, or what's it going to be? Or is it going to be a complete prohibition or a complete prohibition with qualifications? Ms. Braceres, does the text of the 1972 ERA make clear what standard of review courts would apply? It does not, but the advocates of the ERA hope and will argue that it requires strict scrutiny. Okay, and under strict scrutiny, if it were to apply, uh, what, um, how would that be different? Because currently, um, something like this, where there is a government-imposed distinction, a differentiation on the basis of sex, it is not strict scrutiny that applies. It's a, it's a form of intermediate scrutiny. Uh, Tell us why that matters. Why do you think that matters? What's the difference between switching from intermediate scrutiny to strict scrutiny? So strict scrutiny is the standard that courts use to analyze policies that deal with race, and it's the right standard to use with race because um, in the racial context, separate is unequal. Um, that is not true in the context of sex. Separate is not always unequal. 
uh, for women and men when it comes to issues of privacy or um, places where biological differences matter, such as sports. Um, and so sex should not be treated the same as race under the Constitution. Our current intermediate scrutiny standard leaves space for courts to take into consideration biological differences where, where they matter. And, and in all and, other and cases... strict scrutiny doesn't accommodate that. In no, the it same does way. not. So what might this do for sex-segregated prisons, prisons for women? What might this do for government-sponsored, government-funded and operated uh, uh, shelters for, uh, for, for abused women, for example, or public restrooms, locker rooms, athletic facilities, athletic competitions? What might strict scrutiny do to every one of those? So in the racial context, courts have been very clear that prisons cannot separate inmates on the basis of race, um, even where doing so would prevent certain gang um, uh, violence in the prison. And that's, that's the right standard. They should not be able to separate inmates on the basis of race. Um, if you applied that same standard to men and women, that would mean that prisons could never, they would have to have co-ed prisons. You could never um, separate inmates on the basis of sex, and male and female prisoners would have to be housed together. So protections in law, state and federal as they now exist, protections put in place for women reflecting biological differences between men and different, and, and, and women, uh, uh, based on differences between men and women, would be at stake. They would be jeopardized. They would be threatened, and in many cases, undone through judicial order. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for having this hearing. Thank you all, uh, all of our witnesses, all of our audience for being here today. Everybody who's watching this issue is supremely important. Uh, Ms. Williams, I'm really proud that you're here today and that you go to school at Trinity in my home state of Connecticut. Uh, I hope one day maybe it'll be your home state too and maybe you'll be sitting up here in the chair that I have. Uh, I'm really proud of your testimony. You know, there are not too many people in this country who can say, quote, I fell in love with the United States Constitution in high school. Uh, but thank you for your commitment to our Constitution and for your understanding about the brilliance of that Constitution, and you say it in your testimony, uh, our founding fathers, I'm quoting, our founding fathers were visionaries. They understood that we needed a document that could endure throughout generations. The fact is, generations have fought for the ERA. I've been proud to support the ERA for a long time. And now your generation is fighting for it. And whether it occurs in this Congress or not, I believe that your generation will finally accomplish the ERA if we don't. And I want to ask you what you would tell others in your generation about the importance of the ERA to them in their daily lives? Um, so as I've been sitting here um, listening to the testimonies um, and the questions, there are a lot of concerns about um, uh, men performing in women's sports and I am here as a young woman of color who is in her senior year of college. We're not worried about that. I am not worried about that. <laughs> like, it's the truth. We're not. We have way more important issues that we need to be focusing on. And I will tell every young person, and I've been, I've been telling as many as I can, this is important for us. The ERA protects everyone, me, black women, white women, white men. So it's important to all of us and it's important now, it was important before, and it will be important in the future. Now you happen to be going to, a, to school in Connecticut, which ratified yes. 
the ERA overwhelmingly and in 1974, in fact, adopted its own constitutional amendment by 77 percent, the equivalent of the ERA in our state. Is it good enough that Connecticut has done it? You live in Connecticut? Um, so it's not good enough. Um, I, I actually just want to say that as a young person, I've been concerned about the most recent activity of our Supreme Court, the fact that a lot of our rights are continuing to be rolled back. And I am now actually seeing the importance of having this amendment because of that. So having a law in Connecticut is not enough. We need this amendment. We need it. So when things are being rolled back, we can use it to continue to fight against. And in the future, are you going to continue to work for the ERA? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I joined the ERA when I was, I think, 18, and I am now about to be 22. And I am even more determined than I've been before. I am even more for it now than ever. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Mr. Chairman. You know, I'd like to say that, you know, yes, the times have changed. The times in which we live, uh, where sadly violence, gun violence is rampant, where we see a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans, Jews, LGBTQ persons, when FBI Director Ray says that domestic terrorism and white supremacy are major concerns. So I'd say, yes, the times are changed. And when the times, when we live in the times when sex discrimination is deemed okay, it's not okay. This is why I would say we need the Equal Rights Amendment. So Ms. Sullivan, We've been hearing some scare stories about how our prisons have got to be, uh, the men and women will be put together, but that is not the strict scrutiny test. The strict scrutiny test says the law must achieve a compelling state interest and be narrowly tailored to that interest. So it's not as though the floodgates open and uh, all of these terrible things that, to some terrible things, will happen. Can you talk a little bit more about Thanks. how the, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, once in the Constitution, will lead to strict scrutiny. Thank you very much, Senator. And I, I, I just want to reiterate the point so eloquently made earlier today by several senators, <laughs> including the chairman, that the Equal Rights Amendment is about everyone. It's about your wives, your daughters, your granddaughters, your mothers, your aunts, your cousins. It's about all women. It's it's not about it. And, and why would you be against an equal rights amendment, which is part of the Constitution, as mentioned earlier, of all the other <laughs> democracies with written constitutions? Why would we want to be allied with nations that don't have equality for women, that don't let girls go to school with boys, that don't let women appear outside with their hair uncovered? Why would we want to filibuster something that's about fundamental? equal rights for all people. And Senator Lee, your father was a great constitutional lawyer who I admired so greatly. But Senator Hirono is absolutely right. This amendment is not about the level of scrutiny. This is about a fundamental guarantee in the majestic words of the Constitution of equality. And the courts will work it out later in spirited debates between lawyers in courts about what the standard of scrutiny should be and this amendment is not saying women and men have to be treated the same when they're different. It's saying all people have to be treated equally. And there is plenty of room in the majestic guarantee of equality to recognize times when women have to get protection because only women can get pregnant, that women have to have rectification of past discrimination, all those benefits for women that Senator Hyde Smith was worried would disappear I think that's a false picture, and this parade of horribles is very misleading. All this amendment will do is make sure we can't have a court roll the clock back to 1868 or 1874 under the Equal Protection Clause by interpreting it historically. And as Senator Klobuchar said, 
guaranteeing equality in its broad, vague terms that will be worked out later in specific cases. So, Senator, no. It is scare tactics that this body should ignore to suggest that anything is fixed about how the ERA will be interpreted. I believe it will be interpreted in ways that empower women and girls into the future, as Ms. Williams has so eloquently suggested it would do. But I don't think you should listen to these parade of horribles you've heard today. I agree with you. Um, by the way, we've heard um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg mention a number of times, but it was very clear that she thought that the ERA should be part of the Constitution. And what, whatever statement she was making was in the context of that she thought it was uh, should be in the Constitution. And here is a woman who spent her entire adult life fighting for equal rights for everyone. And, and in spite of that, she didn't think we had gotten it done. And she thought that the ERA should be part of our Constitution. So I think that the, the people who are c continuing to toss her name out as though that support, it's, uh, she supports the proposition that we should not be supporting this resolution um, <laughs> are really off base. Also, Ms. Sullivan, can you explain very briefly how the ERA, by explicitly prohibiting against sex discrimination, would supplant the current patchwork of federal, state, and local laws that currently address sex discrimination and provide a bedrock of a legal protection against, against it and why it's important. Senator, the ERA would nationalize protections against sex discrimination that already exist in many of our statutes at the federal level and many of our state constitutions. That's important because of federalism. <laughs> we believe that people have the right to move between states in our country. And that means that your rights won't disappear when you cross a state border from Senator Blumenthal's Connecticut to another state. So you're, uh, we, 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 it, 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 it simply guarantees for all, all women nationwide, what is already recognized in a patchwork of other laws. That's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Senator Lee, since my name was invoked, I'd like 20 seconds to respond. Sure, 20 seconds to <laughs> Senator Lee. Uh, Professor Sullivan uh, made the argument that we don't know whether this is about strict scrutiny. I, I, it's, it, it's not a, a credible, plausible argument to make. There is no reason to push for the Equal Rights Amendment unless you're trying to push it into strict scrutiny. It, that, that's the only difference between them. Strict in scrutiny, fatal in fact, uh, uh, is the exact reason why distinctions in law on the basis of sex need to be evaluated under intermediate scrutiny. So if you say we don't know what standard will be used, that, that simply isn't true. And what we do know is that you'll push it into strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny is not accommodating of the same things. It is strict in scrutiny, strict in theory, fatal in fact. So it, this is not a theoretical argument. It is a virtual certainty that it will be strict scrutiny. Thanks. Senator was given a senatorial 20 seconds. <laughs> Slightly. Senator Welch. Uh, thank you very much. The, uh, in 2019, we have this wonderful uh, high school girls soccer team, uh, the Burlington High School soccer team. And they got national attention uh, when they advocated and supported uh, the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team's fight for equal pay. And uh, at last year, as you know, the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team finally won uh, their long-running battle for equal pay. Uh, and all of us here, I think, agree that everyone's entitled to equal pay. I'm going to ask my first question for uh, Thursday Williams. You went to Trinity College in, in Hartford? I am still there. I graduated in May. Well, my daughter went there. Oh, <laughs> so I, I sent her a picture of you, told her you were, you know, a person was testifying here. But thank you for coming. That's fantastic. So how can the ratification of the ERA help advocates win their fight to uh, eliminate gender disparities in pay and, and try to be brief so I can ask a few more questions? Um, okay, so in my uh, testimony, I did mention that um, in, after graduating in May, I will be starting a litigation position right. at a very prestigious law firm. And I am aware that, as I've mentioned, the system is stacked against me. I'm aware that while right now I might be okay in the future, there is a 
wealth disparity between a woman, especially a black woman, and my male colleagues or my male peer. And so that is why this Thank is you. important. Thank you. And uh, uh, Professor Solomon, uh, two things. One, uh, just I want you to comment on, rec uh, on how recognizing the ERA strengthens enforcement of laws uh, that are intended to ensure wage parity. And secondly, you might just follow up on Senator Lee's uh, a concern about having the amendment push uh, analysis into strict scrutiny, because I'm not quite sure most of us know exactly what that has to do with the question of treating women equally uh, and not being discriminated against on the basis of a gender. Well, thank you, Senator. To start with the second point, the ERA would simply make constitutional bedrock something we already recognize, which is women and men should not be treated unequally. Mm -hmm. How that gets worked out when there are real differences between men and women is a question for the future. And this court, uh, this court, excuse me, the Senate need not specify to courts of the future how to work those questions out. I believe it will strengthen protections for women, all women, and it will not destroy any special protections women may receive now, as was suggested earlier. Okay, thank you. And uh, for Lieutenant Governor Stratton, uh, if the ERA is to be officially included in the Constitution, how would that impact your ability as Lieutenant Governor to ensure uh, your continuing efforts for equal pay and equal uh, for equal work? I don't know if you heard me. Did you hear the question? Yes, I, I did. There's a little bit of a delay. Thank you, okay. Senator, for that question. I am proud to chair the Illinois Council on Women and Girls. And whether it's an issue of addressing equal pay or the pay gap or the wealth gap, whether it's an issue of uh, access to health care, whether it's opportunities to help more women and girls enter the fields of science and math or access to quality health care, there are so many issues that would allow us with the foundation in our constitution, enshrined in our constitution, that says that no one should be discriminated against on the basis of sex. It would give us that starting point, that ground, grounding and baseline to say whatever we fight for, we know it's a value of our country, it's enshrined in the constitution, and now we can fight for rights for everyone to be equal. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to each of the witnesses. Many judges across the country follow a straightforward mode of constitutional interpretation that is looking to the original public meaning of constitutional language. Original public meaning posits that the object of interpretation is the constitutional or statutory text as reasonably understood by the American people at the time of the provisions enactment. The ERA resolution was passed out of Congress in 1972 and it had a clear and unambiguous deadline. Every person in this room understands what that deadline was. And in 1972, every person understood it as well. In this Congress, I've reintroduced legislation that did not pass in the preceding Congress. I'm quite confident Chairman Durbin has reintroduced legislation in this Congress that did not pass in the previous Congress. Why do we have to do that? Because there's a deadline. When the previous Congress expired, Congre legislation you introduced in the previous Congress is no longer before the Congress. Now, it's not only those of us in the room who understood the deadline to mean what the deadline actually says. In 1978, Congress passed a resolution extending the ratification deadline until 1982. If the original deadline wasn't valid, there would have been no need to extend it to 1982. And even judges who don't subscribe to originalism acknowledge the obvious reality. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a trailblazing advocate, said the following about the Equal Rights Amendment in 2019, quote, the ERA fell three states short of ratification. I hope someday it will be put back in the political hopper, starting over again, collecting the necessary number of states to ratify it.
Professor Foley, what was the Corwin Amendment? Corwin Amendment was uh, an amendment that would have um, basically prohibited um, Congress from, uh, or the states from, well, Congress specifically, from messing with slavery. And are there states that have attempted to rescind their earlier approval of the Corwin Amendment? Uh, yes, several. So Maryland in 2014, Illinois in 2022? Mm-hmm. It would seem that legislators from those states, Illinois in particular, want to have their cake and eat it too. On one hand, they want to say in the ERA context that a state cannot rescind its previous ratification. But at the same time, they want to be able to rescind their own ratification and conclude that doing so is perfectly permissible when it concerns a different topic, when it concerns slavery. Are those two positions consistent? Don't seem consistent to me. Professor Foley, have other constitutional amendments contained deadlines? Sure. Uh, every constitutional amendment since the uh, 18th Amendment has contained a deadline, except for the 19th, which is um, uh, gender voting rights. So eight of the last nine amendments have had deadlines? Yes. Uh, is there a Supreme Court precedent that deals with Congress's ability to include a deadline when it provides instructions for ratification? Yeah, absolutely. Dillon uh, v. Gloss and Coleman v. Miller. Uh, Ms. Braceres, good to see you. Welcome. You and I were nice classmates you, in Senator. law school. Good, good to see you. Uh, let me ask you, when the original version of the ERA was introduced, What was the state of the law concerning discrimination against women and what protections are there to protect women against discrimination today? It was very different. Um, when the House, the House inter uh, was introduced in the House first in 1971, and at that point the Supreme Court had not yet decided Reed versus Reed, um, which is the famous case brought by former, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg that established that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment um, prohibits government from treating similarly situated men and women differently. Um, so that had not been decided when the ERA was first introduced. Um, there were a lot of other uh, things, that, uh, laws that had not been passed to protect women. Um, pregnancy. So, so, there, so there are today vigorous protections against gender discrimination, and, and, and let me ask you. Both constitutional I'm, and statutory. Since my time has expired, let me just ask you, what are some of the potential consequences for American society uh, if the ERA were ratified now into the Constitution? Well, I think one very important thing is that um, the meaning of the word sex was quite clear in 1971. Today, there are many people who are trying to argue that the word sex also includes gender identity. And so... Including the Supreme Court in Bostock. Right. So if, if the ERA were to, to, to be passed today, um, it would open up a whole host of areas to uh, private women's spaces to men who identify as women. Mr. Chairman, I would ask uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record a, a letter from Concerned Women of America concerning uh, this amendment. Without objection. Thank you. Senator Rossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists for your expertise, uh, for lending your experience uh, and counsel to the committee. It was a, a century ago that the ERA was authored uh, by Alice Paul and others. Um, nearly 50 years ago, my mother, who had just immigrated to the United States as a young woman, marched uh, in support of the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, here we are a century after this was drafted, uh, still not yet having made the amendment to our Constitution that protects against discrimination on the basis of sex. I'd like to ask uh, each of you, um, beginning with you please, Ms. Sullivan, if you can uh, concisely articulate for us um, what you believe the impact would be on uh, U.S. law, on state policy, on the provision of services to Americans uh, were this to be ratified 
uh, and um, the Constitution thus amended. Thank you, Senator. It would guarantee that women cannot be treated as lesser than men, that girls cannot be treated as lesser than boys, that the privilege to attend school, to open businesses, to work, to prosper, to raise families cannot be changed on the basis of sex by government. And that guarantee would be built into the Constitution rather than relying on shifting and political, politically appointed justices of the Supreme Court to interpret. It would enshrine in constitutional law, not requiring reliance upon the latest jurisprudence or the disposition of Congress, the fundamental principle that there should not be discrimination on the basis of sex, correct? Exactly so, Senator. Professor Foley, same question for you, please. I think the most significant legal effect would be a shift from intermediate scrutiny to strict scrutiny. Um, and uh, I think as Senator Lee pointed out, that would mean that uh, more laws um, and um, distinctions between men and women um, would be ruled unconstitutional than they currently are. I think the most obvious example would be um, the distinction between men and women today on selective service registration and military draft. Um, so uh, presumptively, those would be unconstitutional, that women would have to register and would be subject to the draft should this amendment uh, go into effect. Another possibility would be right now under intermediate scrutiny, um, it is possible to make distinctions between men and women um, based on their gender, uh, particularly when women are pregnant. Uh, and there is concern about exposing uh, an unborn child um, to some hazard in the workplace. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I would assume under strict scrutiny that that would not be possible anymore. Thank you, Professor. Ms. Williams. Um, so as a young person, I believe while this amendment will give me the tools to fight against workplace discrimination, workplace harassment, um, once it is passed, state laws would be passed and enforced to ensure that I am protected as a black woman and that other black women are also protected. Um, so that's, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Braceros. Well, sex discrimination and sexual harassment are already illegal in this country, and there are plenty of tools at the disposal of women um, who are victims um, to, to remedy those wrongs. Um, that doesn't mean those things don't occur in our society today. They, they, they certainly do. But I'm happy that my three daughters live in a world where if they are discriminated against or harassed, um, they, they can bring a lawsuit to vindicate their rights. Um, that is true today. That was not true completely in 1971 when this amendment was introduced. Thank you, Ms. Braceros. I, I appreciate all of your contributions. I, uh, reflect on the experience of my mother immigrated to this country, supporting the ERA 50 years ago, uh, on the, the founding principles enshrined in the text of our Constitution uh, about the fundamental equality of human beings at the time of their drafting, referring exclusively to men. Um, it strikes me uh, with uh, great respect for all of your views uh, that it is uh, profound common sense that at this point in our nation's development, we would enshrine in uh, the most fundamental legal document that defines our country, uh, the basic principle with which I believe the overwhelming majority of Americans agree that there should not be discrimination on the basis of sex and that we should not rely upon uh, the shifting tides of jurisprudence or the political disposition of the Congress to uh, make that fundamental value a core part of American law. Thank you all for your contributions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ossoff, and thanks to this panel. I'd like to say a few words. 50 years ago, when I was a brand new lawyer fighting for the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment in the Illinois State Senate, many people, including a woman named Phyllis Schlafly, who was from the state of Illinois, so told us that what we thought were the issues were not really the issues. The real issue was the fate and future of public restrooms and whether or not you would have privacy in those restrooms based on gender. Now we hear that what's at stake really is not a constitutional right for women, but the fate of field hockey. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to keep up with the arguments here. but It might not mean a lot to you, sir, but it means a lot to the girls who play. See, I, I, I believe you have a sincere belief in that, and I believe those girls would 
probably feel very strongly about the issue if they're field hockey players. Particularly when they're displaced by males on the varsity team. But you see, that's what the argument comes down to, the fate of field hockey. And I think it is much more fundamental. We are talking about the role of women in the United States of America and where we stand. Ms. Williams, I heard your reference earlier to younger generations puzzled, shaking their head at all these gray-haired politicians who are struggling with the very basic question as to whether women's rights should be enshrined in the Constitution. And they're off on tangents that most young people just don't get. We don't, right. am, I, am I putting words I in agree. Your... No, I agree. I definitely agree. The concern about the sports, that's not what we're worried about. I'm pretty sure there are way more important things for young people to be stressing about at the moment. And at the heart of this is the Dobbs decision and other decisions which relate to the right and role of women today. I think there has been a dramatic evolution in my lifetime of the role of women, and I'm sure glad that my daughters uh, and I assume my granddaughters will benefit from that. But we can't stop. If we don't get down, Ms. Sullivan, to the basics of whether or not there's a constitutional guarantee, I think uh, we have another senator on the way, so I'll speak for a few minutes more, uh, which is the chairman's prerogative, I guess. If we don't get down to the fundamental basics of whether the law recognizes that. And I guess we have to ask ourselves, why is there so much fear of this on the other side? Why do they think this is so threatening in terms of families, the role of women? We hear about prisons and all these things. And yet, if you went to the basic question of what, should we maintain strict scrutiny when it comes to race, I haven't heard a single person here say, no, let's get rid of it. They should, I believe, apply that standard and honor that standard in the future. So why not the role of women as opposed to men? I'm glad Senator Padilla is here. I'm going to let him, I'm going to recognize him if he's prepared. Are you ready, Alex? Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the, the patience and uh, uh, understanding. Uh, just returned from uh, presiding over the Senate. There's a vote open, I'm sure you're aware, so uh, we'll be making our way soon. But I uh, wouldn't want to miss this opportunity to offer some uh, remarks. I appreciate uh, you and Ranking Member uh, Graham for holding this uh, important hearing. Uh, as we've discussed this morning, the ERA is and always has been about addressing sex-based inequality. For generations, women have had to fight for access to some of our most basic rights. And uh, in my view, last summer's Dobbs opinion was significant. Across the country, Americans have made their opposition loud and clear. And as we work to uplift uh, their voices, we must ensure that we remember that what is at stake here Rights once recognized by the Supreme Court and held dear by Americans may no longer be safe unless they are enshrined in the Constitution. I know some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, talked about, well, what's the issue? What's the problem? It's already unlawful in America. It's already unlawful in certain states to do X, Y, and Z. But we know those rights can easily be uh, compromised. So with that in mind, a modernization of the law to recognize sex equality is needed. And the guarantee of equal rights for women is non-negotiable. As we analyze this issue, look forward to working with my colleagues to end sex-based discrimination in our country once and for all. Now, I do have a question if uh, Lieutenant Governor Stratton is still with us. I know she was participating virtually. Uh, before becoming Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, you served as a member of the Illinois House of Representatives and were a leading advocate for the bipartisan vote, bipartisan vote that ratified the ERA in Illinois. Want to, uh, to describe um, your perception of the future of equality in America and what the impact the ERA ratification could have on future generations. Thank you so much for that question, Senator. I think the most important thing that I want to emphasize is that the Equal Rights Amendment will remove ambiguity and will make it abundantly clear that no one should be discriminated against on the basis of their sex. 
Uh, we have made progress, and we've heard today, yes, there's been progress made. Of course there's been progress because there's been a lot of women for many generations who have been fighting for this progress. But we have to make sure that we not only keep the progress moving forward, but that we protect uh, any attacks on the progress that has already been made. That is what we talked about on the floor in 2018 in Illinois in that bipartisan vote. And that's why the Equal Rights Amendment is so important to provide a constitutional safeguard to prevent any efforts to roll back the gains that we have made towards women's equality. So thank you. I just want to make sure I get in uh, at least one more question with my time remaining. You know, enshrining an explicit guarantee of sex equality in the Constitution would provide the strongest protection against sex-based discrimination. Unfortunately, state and federal legal protections are vulnerable to future attempts to undermine women's security. And we need to look no further than the recent bills being introduced across the country targeting women's access to abortion care. Uh, question for Ms. Sullivan. In your opinion, are judicial remedies like the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause strong enough to protect a woman's right to abortion access and care? Senator, the Equal Rights Amendment will guarantee that women are equal to men. It will not determine for all time difficult debates in our country like debates over reproductive rights. Constitutional rights are always subject to a balance. And I, I have no illusion that the ERA will end those debates. But Senator, it will guarantee equality. It will guarantee equality that women can't be treated as lesser than men. And this body has the chance to, as the Lieutenant Governor said, remove ambiguity. Who would answer the question, are you for or against equal rights for women? Elsewhere in the world, there are people who would say they're against it. In this country, no one would say I'm against equal rights for women. So why not remove ambiguity about that? Why not remove ambiguity? And ambiguity is all that led the DC Circuit to act today. They said it was not clear and undisputable that Congress can, uh, that, that the congressional deadline is incapable of binding the states. Make it clear and indisputable. Pass Senate Joint Resolution Number 4 and remove any doubt about that deadline. Conservatives tend to like two things, Senator. They like looking at the text, Article 5 has no deadlines, and they normally like states' rights. So why not allow Illinois, Nevada, and Virginia to deliver us into the modern world where we, like other nations of the world, have equal rights for women, as you said, Senator, enshrined in our most foundational document? Well, thank you very much. Wish we had time for uh, much, many more questions and much more discussion. But on behalf of uh, Chairman Durbin, I want to uh, thank the witnesses appearing before the committee today. Uh, today's hearing makes clear that we have waited far too long for the Constitution to finally, explicitly recognize that equal rights should not be denied on the basis of sex. But tomorrow marks the beginning of Women's History Month. There is no better time to move forward on this joint resolution. Remove the arbitrary deadline that was held, that has held equality at bay, and once and for all enshrine equality into the United States Constitution. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.